Wisst du? Wisst du? Das Welt, das Ja, das ist Ja, Ja. So, can I take a picture for you alone, so? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. Well, yes, I think that we often think that um, it's either peace or war. I think that we have looked at the ec economics of war for a long time, and now, of course, we've reached to pass the tipping point of war, where war has become an economic drag on a global level. I think we have to think about the possibility of peace as well as an economic machine. We've left peace primarily to NGOs or to uh, corporate philanthropic donations instead of considering what we can do with peace as an economic machine. I think if we invest in peace as an economic uh, machine, to consider it with economic returns, instead of just throwing money at peace, with the possibility of uh, taking many of our global problems and combining them, we could consider the possibility that combining those problems might bring us an economic viability. What's your personal advice? Um, well, I have three young boys, and I think like all parents, we want our children to serve our nation, but we want our children to serve our nation well. So I think about that, and I think what might be the best opportunity for all of our children in the future. Thank Thanks you for sharing. Thanks. Thank you. Foundation. It's their first gala here in The Hague. And it's together with the Cinema for Peace Foundation and the INET Foundation. Now, the first one is based in The Hague, the second one based in Berlin, and the third one based in northern Uganda. So that gives you some idea of the spread of this occasion and what the ambitions of all of these organizations are. We're very lucky to have with us from the topic of peace, Freddy Mutanguha, a genocide survivor from Rwanda. Two filmmakers from here in the Netherlands whose films educate the armed forces in areas like Congo to end sexual violence. Could you please stand up? <laughs> On justice and human rights, Lillian Tinori, with her fight for human rights in Venezuela, her struggle for the release of her husband, Leopoldo Lopez, a struggle which has brought thousands to the, of people in Venezuela onto the streets. <laughs> and in the area of security, cyber security professor Mary Aiken and Dr. Marco Gurka. We're going to hear from them later on. guests 
here who I would just like to, to mention. We have the President of the International Criminal Court here, Judge Silvia Fernandez de Gumendi. <laughs> the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, His Royal Highness Zaid Rad Al Hussein. I hope I didn't mangle your name that time. I got told off earlier. <laughs> Victor Ochen, the UN Go Global Goals Ambassador for Human Rights. <laughs> and many other luminaries. Um, we have the registrar, I think I spotted here, Herman von Hegel. <laughs> We have Katja Riemann, UNICEF Ambassador. <laughs> and Sharon Stone, mother of three, the world's biggest AIDS fundraiser, an honoree of the Nobel Prize laureates. Welcome to you. I think about their future. And when I see 
these wars that go on and on, and the 76 conflict zones around the world, and the trillions of dollars being spent to the point where our global economy has passed the tipping point, that we now have a drag on our global economy as a result of this war machine. I ask myself, as a mom, what is going to happen? What's going to happen to all of our children? Where will they go? How, they, how will they represent our countries? How will they be patriots? I am very much a proud patriot, a proud American. I also spend a lot of time in France, so I, I feel a little bit like I'm also kind of like a secret proud French patriot. <laughs> um, and, and with so much terrorism in France, I, I feel so, so heartbroken. One of my dearest friend's brother was, was shot in the head in a club in France. And our family went through that with her side by side. When you have a dear friend who has had terrorism in, in their immediate family, and you have to sit with your children and say, you know, Natalie's brother was killed today in terrorism and explain terrorism in your immediate family. It, it changes the perspective. And we now start to realize that these, these effects and this impact is in our immediate community. And I ask myself, what, what could be different? How could my children serve as proud Americans? How could things look different? How could we logically create a different economic reality? And this is what I think about when I lie in bed at night, because I'm like that. And I can see in this room that you're like that too. And so I think, well, with you, when you look at war as a, as a machine that's been going on for centuries, and when you look at the reality that a soldier that takes $17,500 to suit up a soldier, okay, and that's guns and shoes and shoelaces and canvas and uh, coats and helmets and, okay, what would it cost? to suit up a peace soldier? What if we had a peace force? What if our kids could enroll in the peace force? What if we designated parts in the armed forces, jobs that were peace jobs? Not every job in the armed force is an armed job. And what if these jobs in the peace force that we created, what if our kids got online education and insurance. What if we offered something for that? Then I started thinking about, well, what if the money for aid and foreign aid was, was, was put together with this peace force? What if these things went together? Then I started thinking about, because I've raised so much money with uh, AMFAR and Elton John AIDS Foundation and all kinds of these organizations that I've helped over the years. I'm sure we've raised about three quarters of a billion dollars or more, okay? So what if we started speaking to um, corporations that are now uh, have to give money philanthropically? And what if we started partnering with these corporations and say, well, here's where we are thinking about taking money, putting money into this piece of any country, let's say Mogadishu, okay? We think, well, we'll put some money in there. What if you, Corporation X, put some money in there, and we, Government X, put some money in there, and what if our Peace Force comes in there to oversee where the money goes down? So we're not just throwing money at the wall. Then I start thinking, well, we have refugees all over the place, and they're not, we don't know who they are. We don't know what they do. But what we do know is that they had lives and jobs and dreams and wishes and were laborers and engineers and doctors and lawyers and nurses and all the things that we are and all the things that we dream to be. 
before someone might come in and just blow the shit out of our reality. So what if we offered the opportunity for these refugees to be our lead teams in these places? Said, we need you. Would you like to go and start a new life here? Would you like to sign up to be the people who came in as electricians? Would you like to come in and help us build hospitals and lay in electric and lay in water and, and power and schools? And would you like to be a teacher there? Would you like to do this and this and this? And we started building communities in areas that are suffering and impoverished. So we're not just throwing money out the window. And so there's not anyone there watching over it. Our Peace Force is doing that. And our children, this Gen X group that so needs direction, so desperately. I mean, I have a 16-year-old. Does anybody in here have teenagers? Oh All right. Do they need direction? Wouldn't they benefit from a few years in a Peace Force? Right? I look at my 16-year-old and I think, Jesus, wouldn't that be terrific for my kid? Right? Yeah. These are logical ways to string together problems that we have and create a solution, a logical solution, a streamlined solution, a successful solution, and a solution that would ultimately make these areas that could become conflict areas, these areas that are out, free for grabs, and people are grabbing them, by the way, would make them peace areas. Because if a corporation goes in and they start giving money, the next thing they're going to do is start putting their business there. And once they put their business there, they are not going to want someone to come in and blow it up. So these are peacekeeping missions. These are areas of people are going to put down roots and say, well, now I want that to be mine. Because that's the nature of human nature. All we have to do is start thinking. All we have to do is what Margot is talking about. Use our, our cyber, cyber psychologist and put the message out thoughtfully, empathetically, intelligently. All we have to do is use what we know and lace it together, in my opinion. And my opinion is a human position, it's a humble position, it's only educated by my 21 years as an AIDS worker globally, but I took it around when nobody would say the word AIDS. When I was told by an administration that if I said condom, they'd knock me out of my job. <laughs> Okay, so I carried around a purse full of condoms and told reporters to ask me what was in my bag. <laughs> There's a way to skin a cat. And I'm telling you, there are cats that need to be skinned. We are falling into the cavern of an economic giant crisis that is beyond its tipping point. We can make a peace machine that is a winner that is a financial win that reverses the economic depression that we are in, and we can do it together. And it can be separate with hands off the oh so much we love it war machine. We can do this separate and apart until it's so good looking that maybe it gets more attention than something else. Thank you. Woo!